Hi, I'm Ben. And I'm Josh. And this is a Bad at Magic podcast, a podcast about games, life, and other things. And welcome to episode 11. Episode 11. I, I'm supposed to, I feel like I'm supposed to come up with something witty and like snappy every time we say what number episode it is. And sometimes it just doesn't work out. Yeah, there's nothing significant about the number 11. <laughs> So last time, episode 10, uh, you were telling me about the game Hollow Knight, and uh, there was a misunderstanding that I, you didn't pick up on, and I didn't realize until one of our listeners pointed out to me that you were talking about the game Hollow Knight, and I was talking about the game Shovel Knight, two very different games. Yes, those are two very different games. Um, Shovel Knight is more, I think they're both uh, Castlevanias. Or Metroidvania, yeah. excuse me. But uh, Shovel Knight is, like you were talking about, I think, very, very retro. Like uh, 2D pixel art graphics and kind of the MIDI soundtrack. I should have picked up on that. But, um, yeah, Hollow Knight is very, very different in its style and its tone and its art direction and music. So, yeah, very different games. Yeah, one feels like a, you know, full-scale um, production by a major corporation and the other feels like an indie project. But as far as the actual execution of the game, which I think lent to the confusion. But, it, you know, Hollow Knight's an order of magnitude more refined in quality and scope. Well, I'm glad that you appreciate that. Yeah, so you, you encouraged me to watch some of it. I did this week. Uh, very cool. My son's almost unlocked everything, and so he zoomed out and showed me the entire map for this thing. And it was very reminiscent of like looking at like the Castlevania map or the Metroid map. But I looked at it, man, and it did not draw me in. I uh, um, it just overwhelmed <laughs> me. I was like, whoa, that's a lot. I don't want to play that. <laughs> it's that game is interesting because normally I'm not sucked into games like that either, just because I don't know what the draw is, but. For this one, I played for the first like hour or so, and then you get there's a couple of bosses that you run into right away that are pretty easy, and it's like oh well, this it makes you feel good like a superhero, but then they like you get to like the third boss and it's punishingly difficult the fight is, but they let you get back into it very very quickly, and so it, it just turns into like this well I'm not gonna let this game beat me I'm better than this stupid game is, and it's almost like you play it uh, out of spite. Yeah, I watched my son playing it and just reminded me of those frustrating times sitting in front of an NES trying to beat, you know, some boss at the end of a level of Mega Man or something where you just got to memorize the pattern of his attacks. Yes, like how what's the strategy for this guy? It's right. fun though. It's it's still good. Yeah. Yeah. That looks fun for my son to play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It not every game is going to be for every person. So we have a regular segment called Batted English where we talk about the difference between American English and British English. And last time I said we wouldn't do Batted English, but then we ended up doing it anyway because we talked about stabilizers, which means training wheels. Yeah, and, totally on accident. And I postponed the one that I wanted to do this week, which is the word bullocks. Spelled now, is it bullocks or? Yeah, B-O-L-L-O-C-K-S. And I've it's always heard it pronounced bollocks. Yeah, well, it depends on your accent. I said bullocks. Uh, bollocks, I guess, works as well, depending on where you're from. The dictionary defines it as vulgar slang. But it's one of those interesting vulgar slang words, like we have in American English, that has reached this um, interesting point where it is maximum saturation. Like, it's a substitute for almost anything. It can mean good. It can mean bad. It can be a noun. It can be a verb. It can be an adjective. It can do everything. Hmm. This is interesting. This is one of the handful of your bad at English that I actually know and use on a regular basis. Nice. So, so let me I hear was... a sentence of an example of you using bullocks. Okay, so I never use it in a sentence. I use it as an expletive. Okay, so, got it. Because I, I have small children and I don't want them to curse. And so if I'm going to curse, <laughs> I need to be... I need to be uh, uh... <laughs> it's a substitute dad curse word. Very good. Basically, yeah. So, it, stub your toe, drop something, somebody makes a mess. Ah, oh, bollocks! So, and I, I knew this meant what it meant, and I'm, I'm just substituting the English word for the British word. Yeah, the the original etymology of it just means balls. You know, it just means testicles. <laughs> but the are we British allowed to say that in it. the podcast? Do we have to bleep uh, that out? Uh, apologies to my mom and my brother, um, but. It has reached this level where it doesn't mean that anymore. It reminds me of how as a kid, um, the word sucks was starting to kind of reach 
increase popularity and common usage. And it, it, the, initially it had very kind of sexual connotations and over time it's kind of shed those and become much less sexual in its use. It just means something oh. that's not that great. That's interesting because I am, this is one of those times where I am younger than you. And I feel like when sucks was introduced to me, there was no sexual connotation. It was just the, it was just the, uh, I was going to say sucky. That's not very descriptive. Yeah. <laughs> it was just describing how bad something was or how lame it was. So I remember the first time when I was a kid and I tried to use it and my mom was like, oh, don't say that. And now I think she says it. So, you know, it really has transformed over time. And that's exactly what happened with Bullocks. In fact, in 1977, there was a court, a case that went before the British Supreme Court uh, where there was a trial uh, because there was an album uh, that had used this in the title. And it, it had been the, the band that put it out there. I forget who it was, was sued for obscenity. And you can it was be called, sued for obscenity? Yeah, and, and basically it went before the judge, and the judge realized kind of in a visionary kind of way that he was making a decision for, the, for, the, for all time about whether English would be a language that was stuffy and restrictive or whether it would um, be inclusive and expansive. And he basically decided in favor of the usage of the word bullocks and and the rest is history <laughs> so that's interesting like you get to stand like very rarely does a person get to stand at one of these juncture points in time and recognize the point like from this point forward things are going to be different and i have the decision making power and just to to find yourself in that situation would be very cool but he had to be a little disappointed that it was this one it's like I couldn't like decide the next king or queen. I've got to decide whether or not bollocks is a curse word. So here's what the lawyer from the defense said. What sort of country are we living in if a politician comes to Nottingham and speaks here to a group of people in the city center during a speech and a heckler replies bollocks? Are we to expect this person to be incarcerated? Or do we live in a country where we are proud of our Anglo-Saxon language? Do we wish our language <laughs> to be virile and strong or watered down and weak? This is interesting that the English, the British would have this argument because have you ever watched like their House of Commons on TV? Uh, yes. Yeah. So for people who haven't, I would encourage you to go on YouTube and then watch three minutes of any normal American congressional session and then go watch three minutes of any standard British parliamentary session because they are swearing and yelling and almost throwing crap at each other. Yeah. And the ones you've probably seen are the ones where they deliberately do it like that. It's not like that all the time. But yes, they set them up in this room where they're just uh, right face to face with the opposing party and they're, it's very lively. Well, don't take this away from me. That that's in my mind. That's how British politics is twenty four seven. <laughs> just just hurling insults at each other. That's great. Well, they might say to each other that someone is talking bullocks, which means nonsense. Uh, they oh, might say yeah. that something is the dog's bullocks, which means very good. It's like saying the bee's knees. They, <laughs> they might say that someone bullocks something up, which means messed it up. You might say that you gave someone a bullocking, which means chewed them out or gave them a lecture. Uh, okay. Or you could even use it as a term of endearment and say, come on, Josh, you old bullocks, let's go get a pint. Well, that's a normal thing. Like, if you're, I saw some comic on the internet the other day, it was like, oh, people you don't know. He's like, oh, hello, how are you this afternoon? And then people you know, it's like, oh, hey. And then, like, your best friend is like, oh, what are you doing, you old? And then just all expl expletives. Right. Yes. So, exactly. Yeah, I, like that, that one. <laughs> That one I get, but like there's a lot. Uh, again, I'm very impressed with the level of etymology that you do for your for your English curse word that we're doing today. So luckily, the uh, etymology of the the origins of the language which we use uh, was protected by our fathers to make sure that it's virile and strong rather than watered down and weak. Uh, I that's such a profound statement. Like I don't even want to talk about like why bees knees are so good anymore. Like that yeah, makes who, my who point knows? sound so that makes my point sound so like juvenile compared to what you're talking about. Well, it also felt the same to ask what's so good about the dog's balls that we say something's the dog's bullocks the same way we say it's the bees knees. Uh, it rhymes, it's alliterative. <laughs> All right, let's transition dogs? to bad at husbanding. Ah, okay, so this is a new segment that I wanted to introduce because you're bad at stuff. 
well, I want to be bad at stuff too. Okay. And this is, we're both bad at magic, hence the Bad at Magic podcast. And this is something I think we talk about from time to time. And I think it is worth bringing up. So this is our new to- our new segment that we're going to call Bad at Husbanding. I don't know how often we'll do it, but I have enough stories to just do Bad at Husbanding as a separate podcast. <laughs> the Bad at Husbanding podcast. <laughs> Welcome to the Bad at Husbanding podcast. I'm just going to start by saying I'm sorry. And I, whatever it is that you're <laughs> upset about, it's my fault. I didn't take your feelings into account appropriately. I'm going to go sit in the other room quietly. I'm going to give you some alone time and just let you work it out. And then I'll, when you're comfortable, you can come back to me. Dude, you just got 100 subscribers just now. <laughs> yeah, all you bachelors out there, take notes. This is your life going to be. Anyway. One of our so listeners no- went on our subreddit and posted that, that – um, they use the word schadenfreude, which I had to look up, but I realized it's kind of like glee at someone else's misfortune. And they were talking about that as <laughs> you and I were complaining about planning birthday parties. And I think women find that very cathartic. So uh, I think the Bad at Husbanding podcast would be a hit. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Bad at Husbanding. We'll, we'll, if, we'll see what the feedback is and maybe we'll do a spinoff. So my Bad at Husbanding story this time around was uh, back at Christmas time. Like, so we're halfway through almost January, so we're still, like, recovering from the holidays, I think. And this one was, so my wife had taken uh, our kids out separately. Like, she took one child out to the store, and she's like, okay, you're going to get a present for daddy and for your sister. And then she they went shopping full up, and then they came back, switched kids, and she went back out into the same thing. Okay, you're shopping for daddy, and you're shopping for your brother. And then she told me, okay, so now you just have to take the kids out at some point so they can shop for me. And I was like, easy peasy, no problem, easy kill. This whole thing sounds like the kind of thing that falls by the wayside when you have your third child. But go ahead. (laughs) Well, we're not going to have that third child. So we're still on man defense so we can can get this stuff done. And the problem with this one was um, time passed, as time tends to do. And we found ourselves on Christmas Eve, and uh, my wife had to work, but I didn't, and the kids were off school, so I had them. And I was frantically trying to finish all of the Christmas presents that I was constructing in order to be done for Christmas the next day. And then she, like, texted or asked me, like, so have you taken the kids out shopping yet? And it was one of those moments where... Uh, like if it was a TV show or a movie, they do that thing where the camera like goes into the person while they're zooming out. So the background like changes depth. Record you know what I'm scratch about? sound effect. Yeah. Like the, the, the close up on the deer in the, deer headlight in the headlights face. look. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course I have because I'm totally on top of everything and I'm a, a human adult. <laughs> wait, 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 what was the expectation that you were supposed to do the same thing where you take one kid out and then switch and take the other kid out? No, not at all, because I didn't have to do that, because they had already shopped for each other, so that taking one at a time was no problem. I just had to take them both to shop for my wife. Okay, and so, but why is is she checking to make sure you did that? That's weird to me. Because she knows me, and she knows that if I'm not constantly checked up on for little things like that, it's like, listen, you told me to do it six months ago. I'll get around to it eventually. You don't have to keep nagging me every six weeks. (laughs) No, but uh, no, I'm I'm really bad about remembering certain things. Uh-huh. So she, it's better that she checks up on things like that, and I encourage her to do that. I do not. I'm not offended at all. Please, Nicole, if you're listening, you know I need that. Okay. Anyway, so Christmas Eve, you still haven't done it. Christmas Eve, like lunchtime, and I still hadn't done it. And so I'm on the phone, like, oh sure, I, we got this taken care of. And like I, I I send the text message, put it in my pocket, and I like throw the door open back to the house, and I start windmilling my arms. Kids, get in the car. Let's go, go, go. And so we all pile into the truck, into my truck, and we drive to Walmart. Daddy's monster truck. Daddy's monster truck. On the way to Walmart, though, I start thinking, oh, well, I'm going to Walmart. We might as well knock out some of the extra shopping that we need. Like, you know, the grocery list and things always is accumulating. And then there's a couple things that you forget. And, oh, maybe we should get batteries for these other presents. And then I think we ran out of tape for the wrapping paper. And so I'm going through the list and making sure I've got everything. And we go to the shopping trip at the Walmart to pick up all these things. We fill up the cart. And then we leave. Oh, no. And and I had completely spaced, completely forgotten about giving the kids the opportunity to go Christmas shopping for my wife. And now it's too late. Well, now it's Christmas Eve, and it's like early afternoon, and I get home. I'm like, yeah, mission accomplished. We're good. Go back inside. I'm going to keep working on these Here, Christmas Here, Mommy, we presents. got you some batteries. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, no, and then she um, she came home early that day because it's Christmas Eve and she got off work early. So she came home at like 3 or 4 o'clock and was like, oh, so did they wrap their presents yet? What presents? The presents that they bought me when you took them to the store. And then again, again, two times in a day, record scratch, deer in the headlights. Oh, we bought everything except the thing that we left specifically to get. So okay. I had to... Okay, but yeah, you, you're not going to give up at this point. You, you just... can't give up, no. No, not at all. So it's like, okay, kids, windmill action again. Get back in the truck. We're going. And then just the... It's one of those moments where I could see her like weighing my 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 good traits and my bad traits in her mind. <laughs> <laughs> and I can only hope that I came out on the positive end of that equation. <laughs> Uh, hopeless. But, so the second, yeah, basically. And then, so for the second time that day, we went out and we went to a, a store. I'm going to say a store. And um, this time I was laser focused. All right, this is the only thing we're going to do is you're going to get something for mommy and you're going to get something for mommy. Do you kids know what you want to get for mommy? And I made the mistake of thinking that if I let the kids figure it out for themselves, and I, I, th I thought it would be more heartfelt and emotional and impactful if the kids decided the whole thing like they came up with the idea wait wait wait, they shopped wait a for minute. it last what? episode you told the story of trying to take jane shopping to pick out a present for one of her little friends and how fruitless that effort was did you not learn this lesson i mean yes <laughs> <laughs> Well, the the difference was I I don't I don't know. No, there was no difference. Apparently, okay. no, I did not yeah, learn. Same this problem. Lesson. Same problem. Flighty I'm putting too much stock in gifts. Kid doesn't pay, can't pay attention to things. Doesn't really think much about what other people want or like. Well, the, I think the difference was I had a threshold. Is I knew that I that we had to get something today, and I knew we were only going to go to this store that had basically everything. And I at some point I was going to step in and just do that that subtle like oh well don't you think she would like this thing here. And just have them get her that. And they go, yeah, football. Yeah, exactly. Well, they both came up with what I thought at the time was an okay enough idea. So I think my son wanted to get her coffee stuff. And so we went and looked at coffee mugs and, like, you know, French press filters or whatever. And eventually he settled on, like, he really liked this, this cool coffee mug that he wanted to get for mommy who drinks coffee all the time. At least two a day. And I thought, oh... That's nice. He can get her something that he thought and picked out all on his own. That's great. And then Jane, Jane, what do you want to get mommy? And it was very rambling, but the the, the low-level version of it was, mommy does a lot of baking. I want to get mommy stuff to help her bake. I'm like, that's perfect. What do you think she should get? And then she goes, these mixing bowls, and pulled them off the shelf. And it was like the set of six colored mixing bowls with lids. I mean, they weren't bad. They were decent mixing bowls, but they were mixing bowls. I was like, oh, you don't think she wants something else? Nope, these. And it turned into one of those, like, well, let's go look for something else. And, like, we put them down, but she was staring at them. And then we go to another aisle, and she's like, nope, the bowls. And, like, went back around and, like, pulled the bowls wow. off the shelf. and like that really backfired. <laughs> right? Well, <laughs> me being stupid me, like, I tried to discourage her or talk her into something different, like, four or five times, but she's dead set on these bowls. I'm like, well, I mean... They're good mixing bowls. She Listen, does old bake man, and use you them. asked for my opinion. I gave it to you. <laughs> well, and so, yeah. So um, the kids got my wife um, uh, a, a very nice heartfelt coffee mug and a very well thought out set of mixing bowls. And I thought that was going to be great. And I thought everything was hunky-dory until I started opening my presents on Christmas morning and realized, oh, dear. No, no, no. No, I, I did not. I did not do enough here. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. All right. Yeah. So I talked last time about my uh, Christmas gift mishap where we had a discrepancy in quantity and quality. Are you saying there was the same thing? Well, so I think that the uh, the emotional value was definitely there. Like the kids thought it up themselves. They picked them out. Up, like that they, makes they, up for a lot. I, I think so. I, I hope so. Because if not, those scales are way on the other side. Because if it's a pyramid of, like, emotional sentiment, cost, and quality, like, the other two pyramid, we just didn't have those at all. <laughs> they were, like, they were not great quality. They were, they were, they were you know, medium priced at best. Did the kids and, uh, talk about picking them out when she opened them? 
they were they were super ecstatic that they found them all on their own and like thought it up and like did it all by themselves and then daddy helped them wrap it terribly because daddy can't wrap for for to save his life all right and it, Okay. It was, but it, so that part was good. But you can still see him. I was like, "Oh, great, coffee mug and mixing bowls, yay!" Okay, so can I give you a bad at husbanding grade on this one? Oh yeah, how bad of a husband was All I? Right. So you had to be reminded twice on the day, on the last possible day. Yeah, um, I, I kind of like your, I, I kind of like your strategy though, and I think that it paid off an emotional sentiment to me. To me, the the clue if it paid off or not is did the kids say mom i picked this out for you because and you're saying that happened uh if it hadn't happened it would have been a complete failure yeah yeah then then i'd give you an f minus but i'll, I'll <laughs> give you i'll give you a, a, a c give me a c here i want to point out i probably deserve lower than that because not only would i have to be reminded twice i had to leave the house twice because i forgot during the first trip so josh what have we learned um, set alarms for important things in my phone. <laughs> That's a good way to do it. So do you do it right now for next year. <laughs> for, <laughs> no, the problem with that is like, I'll say, all right, uh, right now in the moment, I'm thinking, all right, I'm not going to do this again next year. November 30th, go shopping with the kids for mommy for Christmas. And then November 30th next year, we'll around like, what was old me thinking? No got, way. I got plenty of time. I've got four birthday parties this weekend. I've got time for this. <laughs> Snooze. I'll take care of that some other time. Yeah. All right, I want to I want to um, dogpile with the the bad at husbanding thing. So okay. you know, Alicia and I just celebrated our twenty first wedding anniversary. Oh, and, muzzle tough. Uh, we got married after just knowing each other for two months and a lot of growing up we did together, as opposed to apart, if you know what I mean. Uh, hey, okay, hang on, I'm gonna stop you right there because I know a lot about you, and I've uh, I don't know, I've talked to you a lot about your relationship with your wife in in the years that we've known each other. I don't think I ever realized that you only knew her for two months before you guys, like, got married. Yeah, well, we got engaged after two months and got married two months after that. So I don't think you – if you <laughs> if you do the um, – if you'd ever just taken a second thought and done the timeline in reverse, you'd be like, there, there was no time. Like, I graduated from high school. I went on my two-year mission. I got back and I was married before I was 22 and started having kids. Like, there, there was no time in there for us to have had a lengthy courtship. You don't think that's like an important part of the process? Well, it absolutely is. And I, I can give uh, reasons and justifications, but not as a 42 year old man for the, you know, how hasty that decision was. It was just a rash Ooh. decision by a young man. I think Nicole and I knew each other for a year before we got engaged and we're engaged for a year before we got married and we were getting flack about how fast we were moving. Yeah. But uh, I, I like to think that our commitment and uh kind of uh loyalty to each other has covered some of the gaps in growing up we had to do together you know some people when they get married young then just let the marriage fail and write it off as youthful mistakes and we made our youthful mistakes together but forgave each other and and now we've been married for 21 years well congratulations on 21 years together yeah. now Let's talk about how bad you are at husbanding. All right. So early <laughs> on, uh, one of the lessons I had to learn, and I don't know why I didn't know this, is that women generally aren't, when they want to talk to you, they aren't asking for you to help them fix things. And you hear various versions of this on sitcoms and in popular culture and internet memes, but basically they aren't asking you to fix stuff. Now, for some reason, for men, that's like your natural inclination. Like if, if someone comes to you and starts telling you about a problem, you're like, all right, let's fix this. What do we got to do? And uh, when you are married to someone, you have lots of discussions about lots of things. Uh, and I started to realize that th after lots of frustrating, uh, grating, fr high friction conversations, that my defaulting to fixing conversations was a problem. And so what I had to do was recalibrate uh, and I still wanted it to be fixing conversations. So I finally, one day, I said to her, wait a minute. Are we having a fixing conversation or an understanding conversation? And she got this thoughtful look <laughs> on her face. And the friction kind of evaporated. And she said, this is an understanding conversation. And I said, oh, good. And then I went into understanding mode. And I started saying the understanding mode things. Like, oh, really? <laughs> Tell me more. How did that make you feel? <laughs> oh, what a bad person that other person was. Yeah. And then... 
and, and, and Alicia isn't a gossip kind of person, but sometimes she just, but like, for instance, if there's a hard task she has to do that falls into her category of stuff I don't like to do, she'll do it, but she needs to vent first. Okay, and, I'm hoping this is set up for like a more elaborate or in-depth recent story because this is, I mean, I, I'm not going to say this is like basic stuff, but anybody that's been married for more than like a year realizes that the fixing versus understanding is, uh, I mean, that's a thing. This is husbanding 101. I get it. Okay. So, but this is, I'm assuming this is like backstory for how you screwed that up recently. Well, the, the bottom line is if you're young and you're not married or if you're recently married and you're having some friction, sometimes it helps to just define this. It's almost a bit of a meta thing where you step outside the conversation you're having and say, hey, is this a fixing conversation or understanding conversation? It allows both of you to calibrate the type of conversation you're having. And it, hmm. cause some, sometimes I'll be in an understanding mode. This doesn't happen very often. And she'll be like, wait a minute, I'm trying to have a fixing conversation. And it just allows us to, you know, calibrate. Hmm. That makes that's sense. It. Sorry, I didn't have some profound story or something. But if oh, you're, no, if you're no having friction in a conversation, maybe take a minute and just ask if it's a fixing conversation or understanding conversation. Dude, what's really funny is Nicole and I, one of our very first fights when we were together, uh, we were both still in the Air Force, was this problem, but the other way around, is I was complaining and venting about something that happened at work, and like she was in the car with me, and I just wanted her to like silently be like, yeah, that guy's a jerk, but she was like, no, they had a valid point, you do do that sometimes. And <laughs> it just blew up into this whole thing about, and like, because all of my aggression transferred to her. Like, like, like I was just mad, and now she became the target of it all, which isn't fair to her. And I've since been able to recognize when that happens. But from the flip side of that, like that happens all the time. If you're if your spouse is expecting just some understanding, and you're trying to fix something, now all of a sudden you can become the target for that misplaced aggression. Yeah, I, I got the I got quiet for a sec because I was trying to think if this ever happens, where like I'm trying to have an understanding conversation, my wife's trying to have a fixing conversation. I don't think that ever happens. Well, Never. it's a constant running gag between me and Nicole where I'm I'm kind of the girly one in the relationship. <laughs> Which is why when a lot of the women in my life, when they come up and talk to me about listening to the Bad at Magic podcast, they think they're you. <laughs> oh, all right, ladies, for all of you housewives that are that are listening to the podcast right now, I'm you're, on your side. You're the sensitive I'm there, one. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you, girlfriend. <laughs> all right i want to shift gears a bit and tell you a quick story that happened to me i think i sort of mentioned it to you but i didn't tell you the whole thing since i was going to save it for the podcast so right before christmas time i get this letter in the mail from the illinois tollway uh whatever company and I, hang I, on I, hang on you're gonna have to like i'm not even joking you're gonna have to explain how toll roads work in illinois for me because i have no idea so i remember you saying this before well i've driven back and forth this great land of ours and in in pockets in the united states like you said it's inexplicable if roads are funded by gas taxes then why do we have some places where we pay for roads and some places where we don't and the answer to that question is i have no idea well it seems like you only pay for the good roads it's like there's the normal roads for everybody and then there's the the roads plus, and you got to pay a little bit for that. I definitely have higher expectations. If I'm going to stop and pay a toll or do whatever I got to do to pay a toll for a road, I expect it to be a much higher quality road. You know what? That's interesting. I never thought about that. I just, I, I'm always so flabbergasted by toll roads. I never think more and more about like the revenue resource uh, conflict there or what the expectations should be. Well, but you're right. If you're paying just to drive on this road, there should be service stations like 1950 style where I pull up and three guys jump out and I start absolutely cleaning right. my windshield and like filling up my tank. Like, can we get you a drink or some candy, boss? Right. Like, it, you don't just expect like the standard, oh, potholes everywhere and constantly under construction. I want this road to work. Yeah. And it's easy for roads to work. They just have to be there. Well, there's starting to be tension in this modern world. I mean, we're kind of start we're reaching almost the post electric car phase where instead of electric cars getting like a reserved parking spot in the very front, they're starting to become commonplace that we're having to decide how to make them mainstream instead of just something exceptional that we're trying to incentivize. And one of the things they're realizing is that if you pay for roads with gas taxes and a certain portion of your users, <laughs> users of the road aren't paying for gas, then they're mm. utilizing the road for free. Interesting. And tolls like, is one way to get around that. Other than like asking electric car buyers to pay uh, road taxes voluntarily or tax it on the purchase price of the car. I don't know what you would do. 
Oh, we we privatize roads. That's what we do. Like I seventeen is now owned by Circle K, and they're just gonna take <laughs> care of it the whole way. I think it branded logos everywhere. And oh yeah, when you transition from the uh, the Seven Up North South onto the Dr Pepper East West, it's a little jarring going from that teal and bright green color scheme to the dark reds and the blacks, like with the lane line. I yeah. can see like reflectors like being logoized. They, they've already <laughs> branded all of our sports stadiums. Why not just take the next logical step? Well, they've already got the food signs that I never understand. It's like, oh, food on this exit. It's like Starbucks. Okay, first of all, Starbucks isn't food. Like, I don't care. Like, that's not food. But why is there a sign telling me what like commercial restaurants are there and how much those restaurants pay to be on that sign? That's a good question. And yeah, like why? what about the ones that aren't on the sign? Do they just need to get a bigger sign and anyone that wants to can be on it? Or what blows my mind even more is the sign when you see it's like, oh, food, Arby's, and it's like six miles that way. But there's like a Carl's Jr. within like sight like and it's right not off on the of the sign. ramp. And it's not on the sign. Six miles? Have you ever seen one says six miles? I think there's like yes. a maximum uh, circle and it can't be like more than a mile and a half to be on the sign. You have not driven through the back country of Texas enough, my friend. Wow, because... six miles. <laughs> yes. I think in Texas you just multiply everything by ten. Well, everything's bigger in Texas. All right. So the the in Illinois, in Chicago area, all the major freeways going in and out of Chicago are toll roads. And okay. I learned to drive back in 1993, and that's where I learned. And so my initial experiences with getting on the freeways weren't just driving on the freeways, but also the experience of utilizing tolls. And back then was well before the computer age where he had RFID and wireless and stuff like that. And so there was no automated way to do this. Every single toll booth takes a three or four lane highway, divides it into 12 lanes, and you have to interact with a human being to pay the toll for your utilization of the road, which is usually calculated based on the number of axles of your car. Which is a really weird way to define how much you pay. And, and a guaranteed way to have a constant traffic jam all the time. So especially <laughs> during peak utilization times, just driving on the Chicago tollways back then was a nightmare. It was always backed up and it was the toll boost causing most of the problems. So whatever, they decided they were going to pay for their roads with people utilizing the roads rather than taxes. But they, of course, tax as well. Uh, regardless, uh, that was my experience as a kid. You always had to carry change in your car because if you got to a toll booth and you didn't have the money, like the, the process wasn't very good. Like, they, it, OK, let's say you pulled into a toll booth and you didn't have any cash on you, and I don't think they took credit back then, they would like write down your license number and then give you 30 days to mail them the toll, and if you didn't, then the fees started. So that was the genesis of what happened to me this year. So over time, they developed, they, uh, incre they, they installed an RFID system where you could prepay and you would have a little device on your dash that as you drove underneath it, it would deduct from your account, and then you don't even have to slow down. Uh, so. And then if your account hit zero, it would like blow up your car or like deflate your tires or something. If you drive <laughs> no, it. in order to get the that, that's that's way cooler than the truth. Uh, <laughs> it, you you would just have to get the device worked in such a way that once you went below your minimum balance, it would top up again. Automatically, it's linked to your account. Much more practical and much less cool. Yeah, and and but it also means the government has their hands directly in your wallet. When do, when don't they, Ben? Come on. All right. Well, it's not usually that direct. Anyway, so, but of course, when you go from a booth with a, a arm that comes down in front of your car that won't lift until you prove to someone that you paid to just an open lane that's supposedly reading an electronic identification, you get the problem where people can just drive through without having paid the tolls. So I'm sure as part of instituting the electronic distribution system, they also uh, installed cameras so that they could take pictures of license plates of violators. That makes perfect sense. Like there's a little picture that gets snapped every time somebody's driving through. And then if they paid or not, depends on whether that image actually gets saved and sent somewhere. Right. Now you still get the situation where someone might not have cash in their car or their device didn't function or whatever. And they give you the benefit of the doubt, which is like, you know, the, the standard government, like two weeks and then, and then the fees start and you hear the apocryphal stories about someone that left their car in like the airport parking lot and they owe $250,000 in late fees. It's kind of <laughs> like that, you know, it, the escalation is just nonsensical. So, uh, basically a month ago, some car 
uh, drove up in Chicagoland, which is six hours away from where I live, uh, and ran uh, six toll booths. And their their license plate got taken the photos. And after the 30 days passed and they didn't pay it, they sent out the uh, fines to the person that utilized the toll booths. And so I got this letter in the mail. Dear Mr. Rich, you owe $111 for um, unpaid tolls. And, and, and of that, like $7 was the tolls. And then the other, you know, $105 or $104 was, was fee, was late fees. All right. That's how that goes. Right. Um, and I looked at it. I looked at the photo, which was printed out in black and white. And of course. the first thing I noticed was it wasn't my car. Like it was like a, a Nissan uh, Pathfinder or something like that. I'm like, crap, this isn't my car. And then I looked at the license plate number. And I don't know my license plate numbers by memory. So I kind of run outside and I look at it. And I realize that it is my exact license plate number. Oh, interesting. So wait, so the same license plate number, but different car. Right. So different state. Yes. Yes. Okay. But you couldn't you couldn't tell what state it was from the image. So okay. I called the customer non-service number on there and the first experience <laughs> I get is that uh it, it I get I get this this ominous warning. Uh hello, thank you for calling the Illinois Tollway system. Uh we would have you know that our um call center is staffed with employees um, oh, I forget the verbiage they use. It was basically warning me that there was some kind of like um, employing the homeless project or something like that. Ooh, ooh. oh, like, that's no good. Yeah, they were they were kind of. It, they didn't say it explicitly. It was like, please have low expectations of the degree of service you're going to receive from calling this number. <laughs> so I'm like, oh great. So I get on with the person and I I tell them my problem and they go, um, our system isn't working. Can you call back later? I'm like, oh, jeez. Uh, so no. That's, that's no, I number, can't. That's fail number one. Yeah, could you please move forward in the drive-thru? Yeah, no, that was fail number one. <laughs> so I call back a couple of days later, and I'm anxious about this because, of course, the letter has all these threats about, it, you know, increasing fees if I don't pay it right away. And uh, I get through to a person in a reasonable amount of time, to be fair. And the uh, person looks at the image of the first run toll and they go oh this is a connecticut license plate i'm oh. like great so uh release fees and i'll talk to you later he's like hang on let me look at the second image oh and he's like oh so connecticut license plate and, and i'm like okay great so i'll go now he goes hang on let me look at the third image and this oh, goes geez. on for all six and he's like yep connecticut yep connecticut yep i'm like hello this <laughs> this wasn't me that's not my car i wasn't there can you just dismiss the whole thing and let me go now, ben, he could have gotten off of the tollway, and you could have gotten on right behind him. Okay, uh, like this is a thing in a, in some universe that could have happened. Yeah. So yeah, he finally is convinced that all six photos are of someone else's car, and they just <laughs> sent me a hundred eleven dollar bill for no reason. Um, and then he goes, and this is this is the part that kills me. All right, what I'm like, so you're gonna dismiss the fees, right? He's like, oh no, I don't have the authority to do that. Okay, so you're going to start the process that escalates that'll get these yeah, removed, right? Yeah, but he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't give me any kind of assurance that it's going to work. He's like, <laughs> I will open. And I hated the language he used. Okay, I'll open a case to get escalated to our tier two support, and we'll nominate your case to have the fees waived. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Can, do we have to use that kind of language? These are not my fees. That's not my car. <laughs> Listen, Mister employed employing the homeless person i understand that i have low expectations of you but you've got to use like english words with me here for a second yeah is anyway. what i want going to actually happen so he assured me that a case was opened and then he told me hey, why do we do this kind of thing in government i hate i hate being a government employee i feel accountable for this in some way he says <laughs> you you're gonna have to call back in a week to make sure that it was successful Yes, that is absolutely true because there is no mechanism internal to them that is going to verify that the stuff that they say, hey, this needs to get done, actually gets done. And so it defaults the responsibility back to you, the person who actually has a dog in the fight because nobody else cares. You nailed it. And, 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 and it's still up to me to prove that those photos that they have in their system that kicked off this whole <laughs> process aren't me. 
So, how, sir, how can you say this isn't your car? Well, do you see children hanging out every window of that car? <laughs> that is clearly not my vehicle, sir. Anyway, the end is anticlimactic. I called back and the case was closed and I no longer owe the fees. Well, that's that's good. I'm glad that this, this ended with a win for the rich family and a win for the bureaucracy of the Illinois, Illinois tollway system. So I'm sure we'll have future installments of Ben versus bureaucracy. This one, I'll add a win in, in the Ben column. All right. Well, actually, you said something in there that reminded me of a uh, thing that I do, and actually, it's happened recently, and it blew the minds of the people around me. So, I want to, if you don't mind, can I tell a quick little story? Yeah. I, in fact, I love this thing that you do. It made me rethink how I take on life. <laughs> so, yes, I um, like you're talking about uh, being against bureaucracy. Just, just you, the little guy against the world, right? So there I was. Uh, we had we'd gone out to the park. Uh, it was me and my family, and my uh, my parents were there. The grandparents. We had uh, this was the day that we launched all the rockets and had a, a, a fun time with the kiddos. And then we're like, oh, let's grab some let's grab some food, and then we'll all go our separate ways. And so my parents were in my car because I was giving them a lift back to their house, and we're gonna go through the drive through and we're gonna get McDonald's food, and then we're gonna leave. And so I get to the drive through and it's one of those ones that has the double ordering. So two people can order at the same time. And then you've got to like yeah. play chicken to see who gets to go first in the, and then, in the and actual drive through portion. And that gives them more opportunity to mess up your order. Right. Which it, it's fine. You honestly, usually I have pretty good success rate with that. I think they take your picture or something nowadays so they can like, like this is this guy's order. But they do that thing. Wow. And they did this thing for us because we ordered, I mean, there were six people in the car. So we ordered, you know. Like oh, I'm, man. I have not a maximum absurd. number. I won't go through the drive-thru if there's more than three people in the car. Uh, that's – well, then you're just eliminating, like, all potential drive-thru opportunities for yourself. Holy but crap. That's, I mean, what do you do? Do you have every person in the car shout out their order? Do they tell you in advance and you try to remember everyone's order? I, I mean, then you get that weird thing where, like, they're telling you, but they're not telling the drive-thru person, and then it gets double ordered? No. Okay, well, maybe this – I don't have this problem because I right, – so, one, I have a very good memory. And two, I know what my entire family wants. So I, I have all four of my family's orders on, on quick draw, on speed dial in my brain. So I just had to remember two extras. All right. That's well, when you say it that way, it seems kind of simple. So it, I had to remember three, basically. My standard default that I get whenever I go to McDonald's for my whole family. And then the two extra things that were being told to me live at the time as I, was at, as I needed them. That's nice so, that your family is so predictable. <laughs> well, it's my kids. My ki- you know how kid, little kids are. It's like, okay. Do you want pizza, macaroni and cheese, ramen, sushi, steak, uh, buffalo, uh, you know, uh, s- filet mignon, <laughs> do you, uh, uh, souffle, or do you want the chicken nuggets and french fries? Chicken nuggets and french fries, hands down every time. Doesn't all matter right. where you are, how fancy it is, that's all, that's all we ever get. Okay, so six people wasn't as bad as it sounded. Right. So we order our food, which is a normal human amount of food. Like, we're big people, but we all ordered, like, one thing, right? We, like, I got the number nine. My dad got the number nine. My mom got like the number two. My kids got Happy Meals and my wife got uh, like a cheeseburger. Uh, and so then we drive up to, this, to the first window. We pay. No problem. Drive to the second window and I get the thing that fast food restaurants are doing nowadays. Yeah. It's like, okay, here's your – we got your drinks. Can we get you to go ahead and pull around to the front and park in one of the spots that are, that are marked out front? And then when your food's ready, we'll bring it out to you. And See, so – did you see that movie about the origin of McDonald's called The Founder? No, I did not. There's this brilliant scene where they basically take their entire production kitchen and go set it up in a tennis court where they draw chalk photos all over the ground of where the, everything is. And then they have an entire kitchen staff standing in this tennis court pretending to produce things. And they watch it and orchestrate it to see where people are bumping into each other and where the friction points are. And I imagine that McDonald's Corporation employs some middle manager who's sitting around and saying, how can we make our drive through times faster? Where are our pinch points? Where's our friction? Ben, I know exactly what this is. What this is, is I ordered, a, I ordered a, a, an above average amount of food and it wasn't ready immediately. So now, if I wait there at the window and then wait for my food to be delivered to me, not only am I increasing my wait time, I am increasing the average wait time for everybody that's in line behind me. So the overall daily optimization of the drive-through throughput is decreased because I wanted to wait at the window. 
So by having like the oddball people like me pull around to the front, they can quickly knock out the people that are behind me. Maybe my time is a little bit slower because they've got to find a guy, remind him, hey, go take this outside and put it in that car. Okay. But one person with a higher wait time is going to be less of an impact on their overall daily optimization than it is if everybody in line behind me is slowed down because I'm a jerk. So you <laughs> – a little bit of foreshadowing there. So you <laughs> you describe that so eloquently. You understand it so well. Why do you resist it? Because I did it one time. I did it one time. One time. Once. One. Uno. One time. And the one time that I did it, that I complied, that I did what the man told me to do because it caught me completely off guard. I had never done it before. I went, okay. I drove around to the front and I parked and I sat and I waited and I drank my drink. And I changed the radio station. And I tweaked the AC a little bit. I looked at my watch. And 10 minutes had passed. I turned off my car. I went inside. I'm like, hey, I've been through the drive-thru. Waiting for my food. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's right here. And they picked it up and they had it in the bags. And I'm like, so I, 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 I can't articulate. At the same restaurant? Or did you just, just give every single uh, food establishment everywhere a black mark for that experience? Yes, that one. That's okay. what I did. All Every right. food risk. It's like, <laughs> that's it. This process, I gave you an opportunity. It has failed me once. Never again. You will never cross Josh Fleshman again. Fast food optimization All right, strategy. So describe your strategy because I want to know about the very first time you did it. Not just this one time with your family. Okay. So after that, I, I've done it exactly the same way every time because this is, this is the great part about it is don't get mad. Don't like start yelling at them. Just be super polite and friendly. They say, oh, so in this case, I had my parents in the car, my family. They go, oh, sir, could we just, you, know, the, you got a lot of food. We're waiting for the deep fryer for your fries. And the guy behind you just got drinks. Could we get you to pull around the front? And I smiled pleasantly at this young lady. And I said, oh, no, that's okay. I'll stay right here. Thank you. <laughs> so and like, hostile and yet so nice. <laughs> and, and then, like, it's funny because it's the same thing that happens every time. I must have done this a dozen times now. And the same thing happens. They are floored, absolutely flabbergasted, jaw hits the floor, deer in the headlights again. I am the only human being on earth, Ben, that does not comply with the please pull around to the front. And there is no training or contingency to deal with people like me. So how many times would you say this has happened? Uh, this has happened to me at least a dozen times. Okay, a dozen times. And do you always get the same reaction? Yes, always, every time. And uh, it's just the person just goes, um, uh... Uh, it, it, because I can see the same thoughts going through their head. Like, he just said no. He can't say no. I'm the person that's in charge here. But wait, he's in the car. I don't actually have any authority over him yeah, to tell him like what to do. Yeah, it's not like you're, like, trying to, like, poke something through the window or something like that. Yeah, I'm not breaking any rules. They have no authority to tell me what to do at all. I mean, right. I'm the in full control of my The way for them to get rid vehicle. of you at that point is just to give you your food. <laughs> Right? And I'm not being mean, so they can, like, it's like, oh, sir, well, you just need to go. I'm like, no, I'm being super pleasant and, and polite. Like, I call her ma'am, I say thank you and please. Um, I paid already. Like, I'm not going anywhere. Like, you can't physically make me move. <laughs> so, but this, it, this is probably, of the dozen times I've done it, this is the third time that that person then goes and gets the manager. Like, oh. Which blows my mind. Like, right. what's the, what do you think the manager's going to do? Did he tell you <laughs> you have to move? She. How dare you assume the manager was a he? <laughs> but uh, the manager came up to him and was like, oh, sir, like, would you mind please just pulling forward? We're waiting for your fries to come up and the guy behind you is going to be super fast. Okay, so they, they escalated and you have extra people in the car that have maybe never seen you do this before. Yes. Oh, my mother was just sheet white. Just what is happening? I don't what's what's going on? Like, I don't uh, just completely had just freaking out. Uh, my dad was laughing because I don't know if he'd ever done this before. <laughs> he brought but, it, this is brilliant. Why didn't I think of this? <laughs> <laughs> but the manager goes like, well, we're just like, we're just waiting on like your fries to come up. The guy behind you is drinking. You please just pull around. And I go, listen, I, I would. But every time I've done that, I end up waiting a long time. You guys like, listen, it's going to be. And she goes. It's going to be super fast. We just got to wait for the deep fryer for like two minutes. And I looked back at her, Ben, and I said, well, I guess it'll just be two minutes then. And like she had no response to that. And she goes, wow. And she's kind of shrugging. All right. And then it turned back and went into the restaurant. And yeah. <laughs> what do you say? Yeah. Did like two minutes. argue with you for two minutes? And then. Yeah, exactly. And here's, here's your food, but I'm not going to hand it out the window to you. Pull your car over there and I'll bring it to you. All right. So no, two minutes later, they had all my food done and they handed it to me through the window. And I'm like. 
This is an absolute win from my perspective. I, wow. I, this is my expectation for a drive through And then later, my dad, like I said, was in the car, and he pointed out, you know, it's kind of weird that they were waiting on French fries. This was lunchtime at McDonald's. How do you run out of French fries? This is their fault. Like, I sh- <laughs> why, am I, why am I being punished because you people didn't make enough French fries? So I spent several years working at Taco Bell. I worked the drive through uh, and we didn't have any protocol for this. If we ever, there was no marked parking spot where people could pull into, you know, if they had too big of an order, it always just backed it up. You know, our corporate thinkers hadn't done it and we were minimum wage employees and what are we going to do? And what do we care if the people out back are waiting, you know, for their one drink for 20 minutes? Oh, yeah. This is 100 percent incentive for like middle managers or like the store manager to increase right. their numbers. More satisfied customers, faster throughput, better business all around. Absolutely. So, but how would you feel? Because right now it feels like you unlocked one of those secrets that only works because only you do it. Like, <laughs> how, how would you feel if you were behind the car full of six people and you had just ordered a drink? And you know what? This is the question I'm always asked whenever I tell people this. And they, because the, the presumption in the question is that I would immediately flip and be like, oh, well, how dare that person not pull around? But Ben, you're forgetting one critical thing about me. And, and is that is I. Their own life. <laughs> <laughs> kind of no but uh, i believe 100 percent fully in the sanctity of the line first come first serve is what separates mm. us from the animals if the person in line in front of me orders a lot of food that just sucks for me and the law of averages says that that's only going to happen so many times versus the guy in front of me's just gotten a drink uh, all right josh i'm going to turn this back on you though because i know that you worked in the u.s air force as a manager in a base comm squadron where you're dealing with trouble tickets you know yep. and if i if i get 50 trouble tickets coming a day and one of them requires two hours of work and 40 of them require just to go in and like change someone's contact information in their uh active directory object do all 40 of those have to wait for the two hour one but is it fair for the two-hour one to wait for all 40 of the Active Directory updates? No, but can you do both? And that's what they're trying to do with this drive through paradigm. Well, this is – you're kind of comparing apples to oranges because in this scenario, like you're assuming you have one employee. You can only work on one task at a time. In the comm squadron, everything is concurrent. Like you have the ta- the giant hopper of problems that are coming in and a handful of different people that can that can take care of it. And you get the two-hour jobs like, hey, you take the two-hour – like it just – the balls come out of the hopper and whoever gets it gets it. See, I don't think I don't think it's a, it's apples and oranges. There's this um, task, th- this problem that transcends fast food or trouble tickets, where basically some things you get are going to be rapid that you can take care of real quickly, and some things are going to take a little bit longer, and you can do everything efficiently if you just have an exception process. Now. If let's let's go back in time and say you don't have that bad experience where you get asked to pull ahead and they leave your food sitting on the counter and they bring it out to you. Are you still doing this today? Are you just kind of chafing at the non sanctity of the line, but you're complying? So if I hadn't had the horrible experience the first time, I would have had it the second time or the third time or the fourth time. It would have happened eventually and it would have clicked in my head. These people have no authority or control over me. I don't have to comply with this stupid made-up rule, and I would stop doing it. I can't do it. <laughs> and you know what, though? They, they've gotten to the point – well, as you heard, I also don't go, don't go through the drive through if I have more than two people in the car, so I don't get the big order anymore. Uh, right. And, but um, the, we don't – yeah, I don't – it's gotten better. Like they, they've started designating parking spots. They have places painted on the ground where you're supposed to pull ahead to. I mean they've, they've, they've in, institutionalized it. I get that. But you're still waiting for the minimum wage employees to recognize that you're this right. order is done and he's waiting you're outside. You're right. And if you're not in front of the window, you're not in their face and they don't got to worry about you. So my daughter Kai and I went out to eat one time because my, my son was working at McDonald's <laughs> and he was in the <laughs> drive through and we wanted to see him. So we drove through in the car and we made an order. It, he was at the first window. We pull ahead to the second window. I, I don't know why they made us do the pull ahead thing, but they did. And we pulled ahead and they forgot about us, like completely yeah. forgot about us. Yeah. You and, see? You and should we, be on my side. I know. And we forgot that they forgot about us. We were just having a good time hanging out in the car. So we were like singing along to all the songs. And it must have been like six songs. We were probably there for like a half hour. Before we were finally like, this is weird. Where's our food? And we went inside <laughs> and they didn't even have it. It wasn't like you or they had it sitting on the counter. They're like, what was your order again? Uh, you see, you, you yeah. uh, there are three types of people 
whenever I tell this story or people see me do it, there's three reactions to this for the bystanders, right? There is the people like you that are just shocked and like just, oh my goodness, oh my stars and garters, I don't think I could ever like make this kind of uh, so break this kind of social etiquette rule. Like I, I just, I just, I just don't think I could do that. And then there's the people that are envious. That, are, that like look at me and they kind of non like, you know, oh, Josh, that's a great like idea. <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. I wish I was enough of a jerk to actually do that. That sounds great. And then there's the third, and they're by far the rarest. And they're like, that's genius. I never thought of that. I'm going to start doing that. Have you heard any stories of anyone that's done it and what their experience has been? I have not. Honest to God, Ben, I'm it, the only person I know that does this. It feels like the polite, non-confrontational way is the only way this is going to be successful. Oh, yeah. You can't be a jerk about it. Yeah, because you then, can't they'll, be then they'll just escalate in other ways. Yes. You can't give them any excuse to, like, shut you down or move you out. You just have to be polite, pleasant, like, I already paid. I'm, I'm, there's not non-confrontational. You asked me, they asked you, they didn't tell me, they didn't say, you need to pull forward or you're not going to get your food. They said, can you please pull forward and wait out front? And I said, no, no, I'm not going to do that. And so you, you fall in the same category as, uh, I hate to say it, uh, unfortunately, uh, Louis C.K. Have you heard him tell the, the rental car story? I don't think I've heard him. Not that okay, story. Okay, no. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. But he basically tells a story where he got to the airport and he didn't have time to turn in his rental car to make his flight. So he just left it parked illegally in front of the airport. And as he was boarding the plane, he just called the um, rental car company and told them where it was and that the keys were in it. And he said they were just like, well, you're supposed to turn it in. He's like, yeah, but I didn't. And they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and they went and got it. And he's like, there was no fees. There was no problem. He's like, why do I even bother? Yeah, I, I that's kind of a really a really aggressive and mean way to do that, but I can see it falling into that same kind of category of non-compliance. Yeah. He's like, "Well, they wanted the car back and they weren't just going to leave it there and let it get towed. They want my business as, as, at the restaurant and they're not going to like stop serving me after I've already paid just because I'm not going to move around." All right. Well, keep on the lookout for other examples of that maybe maybe if any of our listeners wow this is interesting now to have listeners if any of our <laughs> listeners try this or have experiences with it we want to hear about your experiences i i, I want to emphasize again you got to be super polite about it don't i'm i i'm not a mean person especially with food people people that are handling things that i'm going to put in my mouth <laughs> i am very very nice to I love it. Okay. So, uh, and, and speaking of our listeners, I, since we're about to transition to our uh, Star Wars um, Rise of Skywalker review, um, I'll, I'll do our, our kind of end thing here in the middle. Um, in the interest of producing more content, Josh and I were having such a good time over the holidays doing vintage cube drafts that we recorded a couple of them and put them out on our YouTube channel. So if you're interested in watching some tomfoolery and finding out why this podcast is called Bad at Magic, uh, go watch those <laughs> YouTube videos. Have you watched either of them, Josh? No, I haven't watched them yet. I'm still reeling from the just the horrible, horrible mistakes we both made. Yeah, well, uh, apologies uh, for the audio quality. I'll do better editing the videos next time. But uh, I think we, we, that gives us some content we can put out on our YouTube channel from now on. Uh, don't make apologies. Let's just say, like, it'll be better in the future. This was honestly, like, a test case. Like, this was yeah, a learning experience. Yeah, like, we didn't know if it was going to work. Like, we mentioned several times in the first video, we didn't know if it was working at the time. So if people get something out of it, great. If not, well, you know, it's not for everybody. So, listeners, uh, like our page on Facebook, check us out on our subreddit, and now you can see us on our um, very own YouTube channel, Bad at Magic. Uh, and I'll put a link in the show notes. And one other thing, uh, if you haven't seen any of Josh's uh, articles that he's put up on the badatmagic.live website, um, Josh's random thoughts, check them out. His one he put this week was about how to introduce your friends in your gaming group to board games. And Josh, well done. It was very good and very well received. I've heard people talking about it. So good job oh. on that one. Well, thanks, Ben. I appreciate that. Um, I'm also going to depart wildly from our normal structure on the podcast. And I'm actually going to put the spoiler warning now. All right. So we're going to talk <laughs> about... <laughs> Actual We're, spoiler warning. Actual legitimate spoiler warning. We're going to talk about Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker and probably every other Star Wars movie that's ever been made. And we're going to slam it mercilessly. And we're going to talk very specifically about plot points that don't make sense. So if you haven't seen the movies or if you like the movies and don't want us to ruin them for you forever, just go ahead and just stop listening now, I guess. Okay. 
All right, so Star Wars Rise of Skywalker. I've seen it twice. I have seen it once. I feel like that was too many times. Unfortunately. <laughs> um, so I, I, I sent you a little uh, screenshot of one of my British friends, and he'd said mixed feelings about Rise of Skywalker. Uh, one has uh, – I can't tell if it's a good film or an utter load of crap. And I thought <laughs> that kind of really summed up my feelings because I, I came away from it and I thought, you know, I had a good time. And it was a Star Wars movie, but I, I, don't, I still don't know if I like it or not. So let me fix that problem for you. This is the problem with The Rise of Skywalker. And this has kind of been the problem with all of these, the three movies that Disney has, has put out, is uh, taken in isolation. They are, it is a good movie. And they are good movies. And like, if you just ignore everything that comes before or after that and just look at it in isolation, it's entertaining, it's well produced, it's well written. Uh, it's like as a self-contained thing, it's it's okay. Might even be good depending on which one you're talking about. If you look at it as a piece of a larger tapestry, it's a glaring mistake. It's like this beautiful work of art, and then this smudge, this 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 ink stain. The it, somebody dripped ketchup onto my Mona Lisa over here in the corner. That's the problem, is that you're bringing in all of these expectations and understanding of the entire Star Wars universe into this movie with you, and that brings the whole thing down. When you say the entire Star Wars universe, in your mind and imagination, does that include things like games or the um, the Sith, the um, whatever, the cartoons and those kinds of things? So have you ever watched any of the cartoons, especially like uh, the Cartoon Network ones? I'm guessing you watched all of the Cartoon Network ones. I maybe have watched <laughs> half of one. So the Cartoon Network Clone Wars cartoons are yeah Clone Wars they're legit they're if you they're really good like honestly they're really good like some of my favorite characters from Star Wars are not in any of the canon movies yeah like uh, Anakin I don't know if this is canon or not it's on the, the Clone Wars cartoon but Anakin had an apprentice called Ahsoka Tano and she was flat out awesome. Like, all those shows were, obviously, yeah, they're geared for a younger audience, which makes me feel bad, like, mentioning how good they are. But, I mean, they're good. Like, they have a story arc that proceeds from episode to episode, and they have larger arcs that proceed over whole seasons. Honestly, as, like, yes, they're geared down, and they're, it's a TV show for kids, but it has more consistent and better story arcs than these freaking multi-million dollar movies did. Because when you use this metaphor of... Uh, work of art with a splotch of ketchup in the corner. I think that's fine until then it gets ketchup in the other corner and then the other corner and pretty soon of the movies that you're saying are bad and are good, you know, that six of them or seven of them aren't, you know, then you have to change your definition of work of art or not. Yeah, this this wall mural, this six foot giant painting that we have, if you look at this little box here by itself, it's a good box. And if you look at this box by itself, it's good. But the whole thing is, a, is just a horrible mess. Yeah. Okay. And the, catch, the ketchup in the corner was not a good analogy for this one. Because if we had the Mona Lisa, and it's like uh, Leonardo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci painting the Mona Lisa, and like, oh, just need this one last touch. And he reaches and he grabs, instead of grabbing his tiny detail brush to do like the top of an eyebrow, he grabs the six inch wide blue brush that he's been painting his workshop with and just puts his giant smear across the whole freaking thing. And that's the rise of Skywalker. Well, I think you're right to kind of call to mind the imagery of finishing touches because that's what this was supposed to be. You know, you have this giant character arc uh, across nine films that, you know, is virtually unparalleled and, you know, in its timeline and scope and epicness. And, yeah, it just wasn't – it didn't feel like a fitting end to all of that. Okay. Yeah, it didn't. Now, what structure should we take, like, in breaking this down? Should we go? Okay. We we have our notes here in one fashion. Do you want to go that way, or do you want to talk yeah, yeah. chronologically? D g I got good news and bad news. You want the good news first? Yeah. Um, let's go with good news first. Good news first. You want to start? You want me to start? I'll start. Okay. Go. So, for it. like I mentioned last time, I as Star Wars has been a big enough part of my life that I just enjoy spending time in the universe, and this was that. Like you said, if you look at it in isolation, it was beautiful to look at. It was fantastical. There were moments of brilliance and breathtaking action and, and fantastical, scientific and uh, funny character interactions. And it was it's just a good time in this other place. I've spent a lot of time in my life and it feels like going home. Yeah, I, I honestly, I can agree. Like it, it's it felt good. It looked good. By itself, there was moments, like you said, that were just great. Like um, 
one of my biggest things that I want to say about it, it was visually, it was just a lot of scenes were visually breathtaking. They spent a lot of time and they put in a lot of effort. There was, um, my favorite scene, I think, was the lightsaber fight between Rey and Kylo Ren, like halfway through the movie, yeah. where they were on the wreckage of the... Uh, Death Star. Of the Death Star on the Endor. And they were on this high, like, platform of metal, like, in the middle of this, like, torrential, horrible storm that's going on. And the waves are crashing over them the whole time. And they're having to force jump huge distances to stay out of being sucked into the into the ocean. And then, like, from a distance, you can see, you know, the, uh, the blue lightsaber and the red lightsaber. That just, it looked and it felt great. It felt epic in scope that these two people and these two forces are coming to a head in such a, an iconic place. That yeah. was really awesome. Yeah. Now, and and that also I think brings out um, the brilliance, accidental maybe, of hiring the new cast of actors. I remember, you know, like, all right, we're having this third prequel. We're going to do this. We're going back to the Star Wars universe. W what are we doing here? We don't know, but let's find out together. And we're going to introduce, you know, a former uh, stormtrooper and uh, a scavenger from the desert planet and uh, the son of Han and Leia. And we got Adam Driver and Daisy Ridley and John Boyega. And, you know, previously unknown actors since they've kind of made a name for themselves. But all three of them are just, were just a revelation, you know. And, and like you said, there were these moments of brilliance that, that don't – the well, – how does it go? The sum of the parts is less than the whole. Something like that, yeah. But, yeah, I, lo I loved seeing those three and doing their best with what they were given. And this was kind of the first movie where we saw the three of them together. Always before, it was either Ray and Finn or Finn and Poe. And so it felt like um, Ray and Poe coming together was like, oh, you're, this friend has two friends and seems like those two friends would get along. And they totally don't. And I think that was, honestly, that was a smart move by the writers to make Ray and Poe not get along. It made things more believable. It created tension within the group. And it, it, it made writing opportunities for little quick scenes that would happen between the three that would be more meaningful than just if they were all on the same page lockstep going in one direction you get this kind of real friction between people that that exists yeah i i don't know sometimes like watching uh um uh, what finn's character say i've got to help ray or i need to be there for ray no, it doesn't make sense to me you know she has like these otherworldly uh. fantastical greatest in the universe powers and what's he got you know, bad aim with the blaster. Like, what's what's he going to do to help her? I, oh, I felt like the same as, like, <laughs> you know, when, like, Hawkeye is going along with, like, Hulk. Like, he's going to help. We're, we're sliding very, very quickly into the negatives of this movie, but I completely yeah, agree. Like, that – Like so if we want to touch on that for a second, there it feels like there's this entire – like little mini arc within the movie that was just completely aborted halfway through or hit the cutting room floor or something. Like there was yeah. that moment where they were, they thought they were all going to die sinking into the quicksand and, and Finn's like, Ray, I've got to tell you before I die. And then he gets sucked into the sand. Like, this, and he never this, tells her. Yeah. But, the, the, but the, it, not that he never tells her. It's that like, it, like they ask like, Oh, what were you going to say? It's like, Oh, nothing. And it's like, what were you going to say? He's like, no, just don't worry about it. We'll, we'll talk yeah. about it some other time. And, and like, but and, then, and, but then later, I don't even know what it was. But then later, Poe even asks, like they were in some another dire scene, and then Poe goes, "What were you going to say to Ray when we were stuck in the sand?" Like, really? Right now? We're going to talk about this right now? Like they they prefaced it like it was going to be a running gag. You're like right. Finn had You're feelings right. it was for Chekhov's Ray. Gun. It was it was supposed to be Chekhov's gun. But then after Poe asked Finn that one time, we never hear about it again. Right. It's ever. Chekhov's gun, but they never fired it. Like, yep. Why did yep. we have the gun? Huh. Okay. Well, uh, I have one other. Um, in the plus column, and that is for the first time ever in the Star Wars universe, a Star Destroyer was <laughs> lived up to its name, kind of. It blew up a planet, not a star, but uh, I'll give you that. Yeah, it was close. Like okay. uh, Planet Destroyer doesn't quite have the same ring to it. Though. <laughs> no, but you, there's so much better things like Planet Cracker. Like you, oh, that doesn't <laughs> sound really great either. I guess like you can come up with you could spin off something with Planet. Like maybe right. go rock, like rock breaker. That'd be cooler. What were your other? Uh, so yeah, I had a couple. Plus column. Um, I think I, I have to say I think Kylo's Tie Interceptor with the splashes of red on it. That's probably my new favorite Star Wars spaceship of all time. Very cool. It was. I, I want to build one out of Legos. And it was. It was. Uh, it was clearly and iconically a Tie Interceptor, but there was just enough customized details. Like he had a couple of extra com antennas yeah. sticking off, and he put the red racing stripes on the side. 
Like it just <laughs> that's it, making me imagine like MTV in the Star Wars universe. <laughs> pimp my Tie Fighter. I can totally see that as an SNL skit. <laughs> like Kylo, like they like open his yeah, eyes Adam and Kylo are like, oh, guest. Tie Interceptor, this is great. <laughs> I love the red. Oh, it's got two ion engines. It's my favorite. <laughs> the audio system is out of this universe. <laughs> I, lo- I love the Sith Wayfinder you guys installed. I always needed one of those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll get to that in a minute. And what were the positives? All right, other positives. Um, genuinely entertaining. There was some scenes where I was just genuinely laughing and enjoying myself. Like this is this is this is what Star Wars should be. And one of those was the uh, they were all trying to be sneaky. And they, they found out that Poe was a spice runner in his past life. So he had all these underworld connections and these, like, he was a criminal, basically. Right. And, like, they say, it's like, oh, he was a spice runner. And it's like, oh, come on. And then Finn goes, you were a spice runner? You were a yeah. stormtrooper? And then Ray, you were a spice runner? You were, <laughs> you were a scavenger? We can do this all day, guys. Come on. Like, That's great. That was a great little three-way character interaction that I just, I, I was laughing so hard. Yeah, and then it became a running joke. Like, several times he was asking him that, and I loved it. <laughs> Um, the other ones, uh, there was parts where if you could turn your brain off, and this was the hard thing, like I found myself like fighting, actively fighting with myself in some scenes where like none of this, what they're doing right now doesn't make any sense. Like how they got here barely clicks together and this scene in itself makes no sense. But like that part of my brain is fighting with the part of my brain that says, those stormtroopers are flying. This is awesome. And yeah. so like if you can shut off the part of your brain that's like trying to make everything work. Then it was just fun to watch and look at. Like I think um, my brother pointed out, there's that scene where they're they're on separate like they're like sand boats for a better, <laughs> their lack of a better analogy, and they're being chased by the stormtroopers on motorcycles, and then other stormtroopers went flying through the air with the jetpacks, Mandalorian style, shooting at them. Yeah. And my brother goes, you know, in like a scene ten minutes later, Ray like literally grabs a starship out of the sky and holds it there while it's trying to leave the planet, but she had problems with the stormtroopers that were flying around oh, the, the, the the yeah the magic system problem yeah and well we will i have much to say about that but we to get back like the last thing that i'm going to say that i think was great about this movie was lady stormtroopers two thumbs uh, up Big i fan. must have missed that oh what, no what, there was i i was my wife Captain phasma female captain phasma was female but captain phasma was like a named character we're talking right. about like the generic, like run of the mill fodder stormtroopers that just get cut to pieces. Like My, you heard them talking, and they're, oh, they're, oh, oh, the girl that that was another defector. No, not just her. No, I'm not talking about her. I'm talking about actual like bad guy stormtroopers and stormtrooper armor that got shot dead. Like several of them were female, noticeably mm-hmm. and demonstrably. Like there was a few. The standard freeze, put your hands up, and it was a lady's voice being scrambled through the stormtrooper helmet. All right, that that's what we need: equal rights, more women dying in combat. I'm a, I'm a huge fan Hooray for of, us. you know, say what you want about the First Order and their oppression and their Sith rule or whatever. But I'll tell you what, they got equal opportunity down. Anybody that wants to die for the First Order, that's okay with us. There, there was enough female stormtroopers that my wife even noticed and leaned over and was like, there's a lot of lady stormtroopers. I'm like, I huh. know, this is great. All right. So, so that, But that was it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all of our uh, in the cheers column. Oh, it is all downhill from here, baby. Oh, man. Okay. So the first thing, that both times I saw it, I just came out kind of gasping for air. Now I have an interesting thing. Uh, pacing so bad, I was wishing for the prequels. Um, mm. I, both times I watched it, I fell asleep at some point. Really? Yeah. There were, wow. It, it, and it was different points. I can't remember what it was, but you know, I've I've seen the whole movie in total now since I didn't sleep through the same point both times. But then there were also times where <laughs> I was just gasping for air. Like, can we just stop for a minute and enjoy the beautiful scenery, or have this discussion a little longer, or let these two characters interact? Or oh, I almost like all right, so. Oh God, you're, it, this is in the pacing, and part of it is the storytelling. But I wanted to stand up in the theater in the first two minutes of the film and like do the timeout sign with my hands to the like, guy in the projector booth. Like, no, no, hang on. We we need to stop and recap. The here. Emperor's back, Knights of Ren, what? They uh there was so many proper nouns in the in the opening text crawl. And like the text is going up like you're you're completely replacing and introducing the new threat and the the primary antagonist to your finale film, you are introducing them in the, in the text crawl. crawl. Yeah. Now, now, 
are, are, I was thinking about this when you mentioned this, and I'm wondering, were we supposed to have counted the trailer as the introduction of our bad guy? Because the trailer ends, uh. you know, with the sound of the Emperor laughing, which, of course, everyone recognizes instantly, but they didn't do anything else before to have introduced him. So is the trailer our introduction? Uh, at, at work, all right, so honestly, honestly, Ben, the trailer with the Emperor laughing, I'm thinking, oh, so it turns out the Sith get Force Ghosts too. And so there's somebody on the bad side that's given out some solid advice. Not just oh, like, no. oh, well, the Emperor didn't actually die. Or yeah, he oh, came no, back sir. Or... <laughs> no, that laugh was supposed to be them explaining to me that, oh, remember all the events that happened, like the climactic emotional finale of the third original film? Yeah, no, all that didn't really happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it really does feel like taking it back. Do, do I mean, you like? Do you, like? You can make a bad movie. That's fine. Why? 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 How dare you drag in some of my beloved childhood favorites into this? Yeah, yeah. Like that was a big deal that you know Darth Vader grabbed the Emperor and threw him over the rail. Like, can that not mean he's dead? Uh, no, because they just plugged him into the zombie machine, and he's yeah. he's good. I mean, we're used to this. I mean, look at any horror franchise where the, you know, the main antagonist dies a thousand deaths. So this this feeds into my biggest problem with this whole storytelling thing. And that was the second, I, I feel like, that the what was weighing this movie down the heaviest, the, the heaviest chain this movie had to drag was trying to clean up the mess of the second movie. And, like, there is no doubt in my mind that Snoke was supposed to be the big bad. He was supposed to be the one in the chamber in that chair driving yeah. all of this. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. the second movie director decided to off him. And the and J.J. Abrams comes back in and, like, well, we need a big bad. Or else Kylo Ren can't have a redemption story. Because then, as soon as he's redeemed, the movie's over. Okay. I got a question for you. Okay. Whose fault is this? <sighs> I, I honestly, I, I gotta pin it on Disney, the corporate overlords. They're the ones that have overall okay, but, responsibility. But I'm not gonna let you off that easy. Okay, like there's a person I need to name a name. Yes, yes. Uh, George Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I had to look it up, but the producer of this is Kathleen Kennedy. Is her name? You're so well researched. Okay, explain to me who she, Kathleen Kennedy is. Kathleen Kennedy is the 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 corporate overlord. She is the buck stops here executive at disney who was in charge of this trilogy did she even seen a star wars movie before she got that this job? is the question <laughs> it, that is the question so uh, to think of a good example I, I and i heard someone else discussing this i can't take all the credit for it but of the um the head of marvel studios kevin fege however you pronounce his last name okay and he's the one responsible for kind of the continuity and overarching um, impact of all 21 of the Marvel films that we've seen. You know, that they that they interact between the films, that there's these storylines and continuity of the characters that's drawn upon throughout the whole thing. There is one guy whose ultimate responsibility is the integrity of the IP as a whole. Yes, exactly. And that's what Catherine Ken Kathleen Kennedy failed to do with <sighs> the, this trilogy. So I feel like... I, uh, so this is why I want to blame Disney. Because I feel like they had, they they had in my mind. I'm imagining the IP that is uh, Star Wars as like a Fabergé egg on a on a red velvet pillow, and they're carrying it down the hallway at Disney headquarters, and they walk into Kathleen's office. Like, Kathleen, this is one of the most precious things that we've purchased, and there are so many people with such high hopes for this wonderful thing that we have. I am bestowing this great responsibility of bringing it to, to fruition onto you. And she took it and immediately went, okay, and then threw it on the pile of crap behind her. Not only should they have identified that this person that they're tasking this is not prepared to handle this in an appropriate way, but they should have fired her on the spot. But here's the thing. If you look at her success as like what the box office grosses were for The Last Jedi or even for um, – what was the second one called? Uh, you, you you mixed them up. The first one was The Force Awakens. and everybody Force Awakens went to, and then The Last Jedi. The Last Jedi, I yes. mean, by, by any measure that you measure some corporate CEO, it was a roaring success. Which is uh, – yes, 
But then we, you and I, and like every other Star Wars nerd on the planet is having these conversations where it's such a failure. It's such a storytelling failure. Of course we're going to see it. We can't not see it. We're going right. to pay the box office. Right. I want to see it in big screen. I want to see it in IMAX. I want to have the subwoofers rattle my bones. And then I'm going to have this conversation with you where it was such a letdown and so disappointing. Yeah, and and – you're right. It is. It just feels like this monumental missed opportunity. I mean, there's no taking it back. There's no redoing it. There's no mulligan <sighs> here. It just is what it is. Yeah. And there's other opportunities in the future. I, the Mandalorian gives me a glimmer of hope. But yeah. it feels like, you know, on this level of if someone had sat down when Disney bought the Star Wars IP and had taken this Fabergé egg, is it, to use your metaphor, <laughs> and treasured it and cherished it and made a plan it, i don't think it mattered that they hired three different directors but they didn't need to have such creative freedom that they could just break all the rules of the universe and then we have to spend an entire film undoing what we did in the second of the trilogy <sighs> our, our capstone movie half of the time was spent trying to make us believably accept that palpatine somehow survived not only his his being bodily thrown into the freaking reactor of the space station, but then the space station then crashing to the planet and then somehow transporting himself halfway across the galaxy and plugging himself into this Lazarus machine and then staying totally silent for decades while he executed and built up an army out of literally nothing until... Until 16 hours before he was ready to blow up every populated planet on the in the galaxy. And then he's like, okay, I just can't wait anymore. I've got to tell everybody they're going to die. <laughs> I, I couldn't. I, that's when I checked out. When like, uh, you know, a thousand fully manned Star Destroyers rise up out of the dirt. I was <sighs> like, all right, that's it. I checked out. Uh, my, everybody keeps asking. Like, like my wife, my brother, everybody that's seen the movie is like, where did those all come from? It's like, oh, that was just First Order stuff. They were hidden, right? I'm like, no. No, the movie's trying to explain to us that Palpatine had those constructed, manned, and like trained and equipped and everything completely in secret over the course of many decades. Yeah. Uh, <sighs> so, so imagine an alternate universe where George Lucas held out for another 10 years before selling the Star Wars IP to Disney. And Ian McKellen is dead. Carrie Fisher is dead. Harrison Ford is dead. Mark Hamill's probably retired. Uh, Billy D. Williams is maybe dead, and now we have a completely different execution of this next foray into the Star Wars universe post uh, Return of the Jedi. Okay. I feel like, like you said, it spent half of the movie trying to convince us uh, that Palpatine was back. Uh, it also spent half on, you know, undoing all the things that had been done in the Last Jedi, and then the other half just paying this weird homage to the original cast of the original Star Wars trilogy. I, I agree with that. Like there was so much fan service and baggage brought along. It's like yeah, just, it was baggage. It wasn't. It wasn't good. Yeah, like, we we get it. There's emotional connections with the with the original characters. That's fine. They had their movies. They can be. It would have been much more impactful, honestly, if they were almost extras in these movies. Like if you yeah. saw them in the background having a discussion. <laughs> That's funny. Like if Poe was going through the headquarters of the of the resistance, which the fact R two and three PO are standing there in like three frames. <laughs> yeah, that have been that have been mind blowing. That's uh, you bring up three PO. He is one of my bullets. He's farther down in my notes, but like. All right, what did I say? Oh, here it is. It's just all italics. Nobody likes C-3PO. Nobody yeah. has ever liked C-3PO. Yeah. They invested in like what was supposed to be one of the biggest emotional movie moments of the movie. Like, oh no, 3PO is going to get his memory erased. <laughs> oh no. And it's yeah, and like the music comes up and it swells and they take this time like what are you doing? I'm remembering my friends and I'm in the audience like Flick him on and back off again. Like, this yeah. is ridiculous. We need the information. He's a robot. <laughs> yeah. An annoying oh. one, too. Yeah. Like, Every it was pissing me off that he wouldn't just tell him what he needed to know. It was a major plot point that everybody hated him, but now we're going to hesitate for a second that he's going to lose all his memories? He's a freaking robot. Ugh. It's like, oh, he's going to lose all of his memories. Okay, we'll back him up real quick. Like, hit the save button, then reset him, and then we'll back him back in. And then you can keep him. Because, honestly, he's been dead weight this whole time. Yeah. Ugh. I think like, what oh, this movie needed was more Baby Yoda. This movie needed all the Baby Yoda. Like, I wanted <laughs> I wanted Baby Yoda to come in and kill Palpatine. That, that would have been a... That, <laughs> 
Ben, you look me in the eye and tell me that wouldn't have been just as valid as what actually happened. Uh, that would have been fantastic. <laughs> it would have been more believable. Ray and and Fi- Ray and Kylo would have woken up on the stone floor like, oh, somebody killed the Emperor. Well, that's lucky. Whew. Glad we didn't have to do that ourselves. So, what have you ever gone to an amusement park like with some friends? Maybe back when you were a teenager, and you're like, all right, guys, we're gonna go on every single ride at this park. <laughs> I'm laughing not at that idea. I'm laughing at the analogy that you must be trying to draw. I have well, done that, and we did it. I think you grasped the rest of it, because that's what this movie felt like. Like, let's go on every ride at the park. And some of them are boring and slow, and some of them are, you know, like maybe too much for you. Or maybe they're okay by themselves, but after you've done all the others, then you do that one, and it's just too much. All right. Uh, iconic lightsaber fight. Check. Character struggling with their inner demons. Check. Another character struggling with their feelings for another character. Check. One character thinking they're not good enough to fill the role that they've been thrust into. Check. Uh, um, uh, yeah. a space Giant epic spaceship battle. Check. A uh, 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 redemption loyal, story. Loyal minion betraying the, the emperor. Check. check. Uh, uh, stealthy Solo. S- check. Le- <laughs> Leia. Check. Chewbacca. Check. R2-D2. C-3PO. Check. 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 Uh, oh, um, a half-assed love story that didn't go anywhere and made no sense. <laughs> Check. Yeah, yeah. It, uh. it was every ride at the park. So that was part of part of it. And and that made me think of it, of one of my favorite internet memes. Uh, you've seen the movie Gladiator, right? I have, you know, Russell yes. Crowe's character goes out the first time he's in the arena, and he grabs a sword, and he, like, kills every guy in, like, ten seconds. Right. You know, he's just, he's just a brutally efficient soldier that doesn't – kill for entertainment he kills for efficiently right so he stabs everyone and all of a sudden this cheering audience is kind of like oh that was terrible and everyone's sitting there in like aghast in silence and he's like (laughs) are you not entertained (laughs) and i felt like that after i watched this so 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 kylo needed kylo needed to look at the camera and actually say that it's like is this not good enough for you yeah (laughs) <laughs> you, you came to see all these Star Wars things. You, you want to see a lightsaber battle or everybody, yeah. You want to see the bad guy being a bad guy? Are you not entertained? Uh, and I was imagining, uh, you know, that meme of Russell Crowe standing in the arena yelling that with uh, maybe director J.J. Um, Abrams' face on him. I'll, I'll put that in. I'll, I'll make that for the uh, show uh, notes. I, oh, Ben's going to make a meme. It's going to go viral. Hashtag bad at magic. Are you not think, entertained? We keep saying hashtag, but we're not on any social media platform that actually has hashtags. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, I, I want to nitpick. Like this is this this whole movie was a storytelling disaster for several things, and I'm just going to bring up points. I'm going to rapid fire match you, and All you right. tell me if this makes any sense. You ready? Do it. Okay. Uh, why is Kylo working for Palpatine? Why? I don't know. He went there to kill him, and then like Palpatine gave a mildly convincing argument why he shouldn't, and Kylo was fully on board. This, Kylo's this... never been cooperative with anyone. That's been so stupid. That was so stupid. It's like, oh, I have this giant fleet. Great. Lightsaber. Boom. Cut your old zombie butt in half. Now it's mine. This is how the Sith works. That is just right. how it works. Okay. Right. So, well, and I've never understood striking me down as, as the crowning achievement of a Sith. But ben, that's later in my list, but we'll talk okay, about it going. now. General, you know, like uh, Emperor Palpatine with Rey. Ha ha. Strike me down with your lightsaber and I win. Ha ha ha. Five it minutes make later. Since the first time, it doesn't make sense now. No, no, no. Five minutes later, Kylo Ren shows up with a lightsaber. Now there's two of them with lightsabers. They're going to kill him with lightsabers and he goes Nur, and they starts fighting them and it's like five minutes ago you wanted her to kill you with the lightsaber so do you not want to be killed with a lightsaber or do you want to be killed by lightsaber you this can't have it counts when i say it counts yeah that uh, killing me okay um <laughs> uh are we just going to introduce new characters i thought general hux was like the number two guy i thought he was the head military guy and kyle was the head like sith yeah, like no. guy under that the was the amp- one thing they didn't take back from the last Jedi. Uh, Ryan Johnson turned Hux into like this just le- a comedic chump, and he maintained that role in this movie. Oh, and he died the the role that he needed to die. Like, died like, like he, a chump. he no, he died like a chump, like an absolute ridiculous chump. Like, like oh, I'm gonna be a defiant. I got shot in the leg. Oh no! And then unceremoniously, no warning, guy grabs a rifle, turns, shoots him dead, hands the rifle back. Well, there's the spy, and then move on. Yep. Okay, so uh, in the same kind of in in the same vein, General Pride, really, General Pride, can we can we be more heavy-handed with our like? Oh, look at my snarky metaphor. It's like, oh God, just really, just just name him anything, anything, General Brown, 
We don't care. Yeah. But like, <laughs> were but we for, supposed to remember him from other movies? Because I had a feeling that we were supposed to, but I didn't. No, he doesn't exist in other movies. All they right, introduced right, right. a new generic character and named him General Pride, just in case you weren't sure he was supposed to be the bad guy. Yeah. New helmet. Kylo Ren got a new helmet. Why? For reasons, Ben. For reasons. Okay. We took it off. We put it back on. I think that was the best symbol of the like reversal from Ryan Johnson back to J.J. Abrams. Uh, yeah, but then he kept taking it off after the helmet that. Back on. Like, I get it. Like they're putting the helmet back together because J.J. Abrams was mad that he took the helmet off so much in the second movie, and then he put it back on. But then he kept taking it back off again. Like, do you yeah. want the helmet? Do you not want the helmet? I don't understand what's happening. Um, why is Rose back? Why is Rose back? I thought Rose died. I thought Rose died a horrible death, and I was happy with her being dead. <sighs> like I. I, I, don't, I I, 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 that could have been a random extra. She was so unnecessary to the plot. She said one random thing to Finn, and like it could have been anybody. It could have been one of the fish people. I don't care. Why does it have to be Rose? It just makes me mad that she's well, back. Not only was she back, she just felt like a, she was doing a cameo. All right. Hey, let's all go save the galaxy. Okay, you go over there and read some books. Right. She shows up later and says, shoot them in the big guns, and that'll blow them up. Great. Good job, Rose. That was it. That was her whole role in the movie. <laughs> Uh, yeah so you so when you shoot the spaceships and their giant and anatomically correct genitalia on the bottom <laughs> that's what blew them all up yeah uh, they did look watch it you saw it twice tell me those didn't look like big giant male genitals on the bottom of these spaceships oh my gosh okay it, 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 but other than that they looked exactly like the old starter stories from the from 1977 <laughs> yeah which is great that's fine why did you have to weld that's the stuff on the bottom okay whatever um okay um since how long has leia been a jedi how long uh, has that been a thing uh, wasn't that in the um clone wars or something the clone she didn't live in the clone oh wars. she wasn't born yet i no. don't know leia was very was clearly very force sensitive she is luke's there's uh, some into, there's something in the Star Wars universe where this all got covered and I didn't consume it and it sounds like you didn't either. Uh, it does, I guess not. Like, but it, like, so if we take all of that out, like, assuming I didn't, we didn't read any of the books. We're not bringing any of the baggage from the outside. They explained in this one, like, oh, she's a Jedi. Okay, so she was trained by a Jedi and just like went through her graduation test and passed, and then just put down the lightsaber forever because she had this vision about how bad it was going to be. So then why, why is the entire plot of the first movie revolved around trying to find Luke Skywalker? If yeah. Leia is a full-up Jedi, what do we need Luke for? Again, if George Lucas had held out another 10 years, I don't think we'd be having this discussion. I don't know. He screwed up the prequels pretty bad. Do you, no, re no, I do just, you remember? I just mean that, that Carrie Fisher would have been so long gone that there wouldn't have been this need to <sighs> like try to CG her into the movie. Oh, uh, While we're talking about Carrie Fisher, did it every scene that she was in, I get she was a great, wonderful person, and she did so well in the original movies, and her character was such such an iconic role in the zeitgeist and like will forever be known as one of the great female uh, starring roles in cinema history. Why do we have to discredit her memory by taking what are clearly cutting room floor scraps from the previous two movies and shoehorning them in into this movie and trying desperately to make them make sense and they don't? Yeah, I don't know. I don't. It, I, I can't. I don't know enough about what happened behind the scenes, but there was obviously a great deal of pressure, whether it was internal because the directors and producers wanted to do this, or is external where the fans felt like they were expected this. But there was this very uh, this mandate to honor and represent the original cast in this film. And I get that, but they didn't do it well with Carrie Fisher because they didn't have the material and they should no, have How many times that. are we going to hand this lightsaber back and forth? Ugh. Ugh. Okay. And then lastly, this I've saved this for last for a reason because I didn't notice it. My eight-year-old son pointed it out to me. So there was a great scene. Again, in an isolation, it was a great scene where... Um, uh, Ray and Kylo Ren played chicken, but he was in his TIE Interceptor and she was just standing around in the desert. And she did a beautiful Jedi move, slow motion backflipped and sliced the wing off his TIE Interceptor and it turned into a smoldering wreck. Like there's nothing left. Right? Right. Great scene. Iconic. It was wonderful. It was very yeah, entertaining. It was, it was the teaser trailer. Yes. And honestly... Kylo Ren, like you expect him to, walked out of this smoldering wreckage without a scratch because he is a Sith, basically a Sith Lord at this point, and that's what you would expect from him. But right. then then later in the movie, she steals Kylo's TIE Interceptor, which we assumed was just like another one they had lying around, right? And then goes and flies off. 
And then, like, Luke, exp- like, oh, I don't have the thing. I don't have the MacGuffin that we needed to find the bad guys. It's like, oh, you have everything you need. And she went back to the new wreckage of the second TIE Interceptor and had the Sith Locator box pyramid thing that she needed. It was blown up in the first That show. was blown up in the first one. My <laughs> son, my eight-year-old son pointed out to me, he's like, didn't she cut the other ship in half? And I'm like, holy crap, son, you're right. She cut the first ship in half wow, of her lightsaber. Huh. No, I didn't. I didn't. I got lost in all. The, I, I checked out. You point this out. You know, there was so much MacGuffin nonsense going on, which which is which is un which is known as a you know just as handicap in a plot. Oh, we don't have the thing. We need the thing. We got to get the thing. I like in the new Spider-Man movie how the the, the yes. cynical, world weary Peter B. Parker calls it the goober. Yeah, there's always something. You need it. I, I give it the goober. A key, a code, whatever. I just start calling them goobers. It's like, yeah. thank you. A- acknowledging and recognizing. This is just exactly. a plot thing to move from A to B. Yeah, how many goobers did this movie have? Like three? This mo- Yeah, it, it had uh, uh, the stupid uh, the dagger thing. Then it had the pyramid box thing. Then it then it had like, oh, I don't know. It was terrible. The lightsaber thing. Uh, uh, Leia's lightsaber, apparently. Yeah. Oh, Ben. Ben, Ben, Ben. Yeah. Oh, and then let's, let's talk about how Bond villainy uh, Palpatine is for a second. It's like, ho, ho, I'm going to destroy the galaxy in 16 hours. And in the meantime, I'm completely defenseless. Whoa. Except for these two towers that control my entire fleet. Oh, my God. Everybody was so dumb about the tower. Like, oh, we have this one tower that's going to get everybody off of this planet. We don't know how. Scientifically, it makes no sense. But that's the thing. This tower has to exist to get everybody off the planet. And then they're like, oh, sir, they're going for the tower. Oh, right, well, then just turn on our tower. And they turn on their tower, and they turn off the ground tower. And it's like, and they immediately recognize, like, wait, they deactivated the tower. Oh, let's go shoot down the tower that is obviously the capital ship. And then they all turned and went. And then later, they blew up the capital ship, and the capital ship's falling. It's like, oh, no, everybody, we're all stuck here because we lost signal. I'm like, turn on the other freaking tower. They didn't blow yeah. it up. They t- yeah. completely turned away and went somewhere else. I but, remember back in the good old <sighs> days when you used to have to fly down a trench full of laser turrets. It, it's the... Uh, uh, that has got to be one of the most idiotic tropes. And unfortunately, it was the Star Wars prequels that introduced this. And like, it, it's such a thing now that it, like, it's a saying. It's like, oh, and then they all died Phantom Menace style. Where they blew up the control ship and then the entire enemy army falls dead simultaneously across the entire planet. It's yeah. like, oh, we blew up the tower and then we win. We blew up the one thing. It doesn't matter. You've got us outgunned and outnumbered like 10,000 to one. We blew up the thing so you lose. It's a very it's a very movie-like thing to do. I mean, I thought of like War of the Worlds where this overpowering, technologically advanced alien species infiltrates the entire Earth. Oops, but they forgot to immune, take their flu shot before they came. <laughs> You're telling me that this advanced alien race didn't take any biological hazard precautions the entire time? Yeah, yeah. you guys are idiots. That, that, that's a uh, uh, Galaxy Quest style. But don't open the door. Is there air? You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. all right so i feel like we need to do something to wrap it all up do you have do you have any others in your rapid fire list are you talking about wrapping up no sir this is we're not we're halfway through my list of things right, that right. i want to complain keep, about this keep going what's next okay so um i, I won't go to the rapid fire list we have to talk about the big the, the the glaring elephant in the room and that is this is soft magic at its worst this, like, if anybody doesn't understand what we were talking about when we were talking about the Mistborn and the Sanderson's Laws of Magic Systems, this is the perfect example of what we're talking about. And it is Sanderson's First Law of Magic. An author's ability to solve conflict with magic in a satisfying way is directly proportional to how well you understand that magic. So right. the Force is, by, is hands down, it's just magic. It's just magic. And this movie did a better job of they had, of course, they had the random things where we're introducing force powers that have never been seen before. But that's fine because they introduced right. it in a phase. I was phase. okay with force, force healing. Force healing, yes, that's fine. I get uh, that makes sense. Um, I was getting a little skeptical with the force teleporting objects between Kylo and Rey. Yeah. It's like, so how are you trans? Like, but it's they kept it small. It's like our right, little hand, like some beads here, a coffee bean there. Okay. Mm-hmm. And eventually a lightsaber. uh, Eventually a lightsaber. But but this is the thing. Like, that's the payoff, right? 
you built up to it through the entire movie. It was becoming progressively yeah. more and more. No, you're right. That's following the law of man. Exactly. That is, you're setting it up and you're explaining to us how it works. And so yeah. it, by the end, that makes sense that that could happen. Emperor Palpatine on his zombie throne, raising his hand slightly above waist level and shooting force lightning into the sky that simultaneously shot down every single allied ship, ship in the rebel fleet in the yeah. rebel fleet simultaneously that's it all bets are off like that's it nothing makes sense the rules don't apply this is garbage it's like why do you even have star destroyers why don't you just sit on your throne and force lightning other planets from where you're sitting because it seems like there's no limit to what you can do with this yeah i kind of liked it better in uh Re um, return of the jedi when he was there and he just thought of everything in advance and had a plan yeah he's like that was his yeah. strength as a character, as an antagonist, not because he was personally, individually so powerful, but because he could outmaneuver people. That's a well-written villain versus a cardboard cutout Bond villain that we got in this stupid movie. A yeah. literal zombie of a character. Ugh. And then, okay, and then, so, then, so this is why it, the, the ending of the movie is unsatisfying, because it was resolved with magic that we don't understand that has no limits or no rules. Yeah, because so like, then you start sucking people's life force, which is also new. And at the same time, the lightning that can shoot down all of the spaceships at the same time and pick out the ones that he doesn't like versus the ones that he does like is blocked by a lightsaber. Yeah. Like, there's an argument to be made that it was a contest of wills, hers versus his, but there is no, there's no way you're going to sell me that Ray, our 17-year-old protagonist from the desert, has a stronger will than the literal zombie madman that has been planning this downfall forever. Now, in her defense, there was a scene in one of the Star Wars prequels, I can't remember which one, where Emperor Palpatine tries to shoot Yoda with the Force Lightning. Uh, he, was shooting, also uh, he was shooting Mace Windu, Samuel L. Jackson's character, with the Force Lightning, and he was blocking it with the lightsaber. Now, right. this, was, this is the thing, though. He shot that Force Lightning and killed several other Jedi at the same time. So it was like they were implying in that prequel that it, it's that, not just yeah. the lightsaber. There right. is something else going on. He also had some will. Yes, there is some. He is yeah. putting some kind of force energy and using the lightsaber. I'm just saying, as, as far as like what you're saying about magic systems, that one we did had seen a little bit before. But but before we had only ever seen force lightning, like like hurting one person right. at a time, shock a guy, yeah, and, and like not lethally too. Like yeah. Luke was like, ah, this is uncomfortable. Yeah, exactly. He was being force tased <laughs> for like several minutes before anything happened. <laughs> I like it. We're calling it that, too, because that lightning didn't blow up the ships either. It was just kind of tasing them. They're like, oh, no, my controls are malfunctioning. Yeah, but the scope, this is the thing, like, the, the scale was so phenomenally different. Like, so sure. this forced lightning that can take out <laughs> thousands of ships at the same time is a... I'm is never a, calling it forced lightning again. <laughs> <laughs> forced tasing. <laughs> Oh, and then for a second we get this this glimmer that like uh, like Ray healed uh, Ren or something, and then he goes like, and then he had this profound like inner like, oh, I understand the force, like oh, the life force shared between you is this massive, unbelievable thing, like oh, he does kind of know what he's talking about, but then he goes right back to the force lightning again, like are you like do you have no other capabilities? You know nothing else what to do here. Like and then the the scene that you were talking about in the prequels where he's force lightning force tasing Mace Windu and he's got the lightsaber up and it's being like Mace Windu is reflecting it back at him and that's kind of like the origin of his like screwed up face because he yeah. was suffering from his own force lightning and it started happening again when Ray had the two lightsabers and she's like reflecting his force lightning back at him dude knock it off with the freaking force <laughs> lightning just stop you're like <laughs> stop hitting yourself like how stupid are you yeah. Oh, and oh, and how is uh, she? Did she have to kill him with the lightsaber? Did killing him with his own force lightning not count for the whole Sith ritual that he had been building up this whole time? Maybe it was like a taser, and his finger was stuck on the trigger. Ah, uh, this this is all right. So Sanderson's law of magic systems. Yep. It was an unsatisfying ending because nobody in the theater had any idea what was happening or what would right. happen next or what anybody could even do in this scenario. Oh, because right. we went from teleporting lightsabers to other rooms to shooting down all the spaceships with my fingers to killing you by reflecting your own powers at you with my, my laser stick to then transferring the soul that apparently was not entirely sucked out of me into another person to heal them. 
Oh, and then while we have all these really muddy, confusing waters, that's half this moment where they kiss and make out like they're like they're super hot for each other, and then one of them die. Just to just to make sure that nobody leaves the theater having any idea what happened. I almost feel like you could call it George Lucas's magic system. Because when I reflect <laughs> on A New Hope, it's like he spent the whole movie, you know, where you there's things like star destroy, you know, a, a death star that can blow up an entire planet and lightsabers and blasters and stuff. And we can grok all that easily. You just look at it and you go, oh, that's destructive. That's dangerous. Yes. And yet the whole time Obi-Wan is teaching Luke that above all of that, more than that is the force. You can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't touch it, but it's going to be the answer to all the big guns and all the explosions and all the ships and all of that is the force. And the resolution at the end comes because of the force. So it's like he spent this whole time setting us up to believe in this soft magic system and then at the end the resolution comes through the soft magic system. Yes, and the, the magic system was much less soft. It was much harder in the original prequels because it wasn't so blown out of proportion to be ridiculous. It yeah. was it was like faster reflexes. It was a sense of what was coming. It was like this inner peace and rest. It was almost like a Zen Kung Fu kind of thing. Knowing without knowing. Yeah. And like the, the biggest thing, the biggest and fanciest thing that we ever saw anybody do in any of those movies was a little bit of forced tasing from the Emperor. And yeah. then maybe like a forced jump from Luke. And then Luke force pulled the lightsaber. He never force pulled a whole starship out of the sky. He never, yeah. like, disabled thousands but of ships. also, like, like in Return of the Jedi, I mean, sorry, in Empire Strikes Back, Yoda was teaching Luke that it's that size matters not. Right, and, like, there's other uh, things, like, in the video games. I remember there's a scene in a video game where there's a, there's, <laughs> there's a character that you play as called Starkiller. Yes, his name is Starkiller. And he force pulled a uh, Star Destroyer out of orbit into the planet. And now, wow. yeah, it... And that's really stupid and overpowered, but it was it was really awesome. And like the whole <laughs> like the whole shtick of the game was like this guy was just super overpowered. And again, the point of the game was you have to play. Like at one point, you walk into this room and like these doors open, and it's this hangar bay full of like ATSTs and stormtroopers, like hundreds of them. And you're like, oh, this is gonna be a fun few minutes. And you didn't feel threatened at all because you were a superhero walking in this room. Yeah, you know a character we haven't mentioned at all that's kind of like that is Poe. So I think at some point they're like, all right, well, we're kind of under budget on our special effects and we haven't really given Poe anything to do. So what can we do? And one guy in the corner is like, I got it. Light speed skipping. Uh, we're going to break all our rules again. That's, yeah. Um, we but have. but it, it's, it, that was like most of the special effects shot in the movies was that like two minutes of light speed skipping. Okay. So let's go back to A New Hope. Because that whole the, all these scenes you're talking about where Obi-Wan's teaching Luke about the Force, they were in hype, like light speed that whole time. Like they were in light speed for hours trying to get from one yeah. place to another. And Poe is throwing this lever for seconds and he's going from one atmospheric planet to another, like inside yeah. a city. Like, is this light speed? Are we like warping to these places now? You, and. And we're being chased by TIE fighters. And if you remember in A New Hope, they say th that's a scout ship. It, it doesn't have enough range. Yeah, like, they don't, they they don't have do that. They, yeah, fighters don't have hyperdrive. That's the whole point. That's the reason you have Star Destroyers is you park right. them all in there and that then the mama ship carries them where they need to go. Exactly. Yeah, uh, just breaking all the rules of the universe. Uh, while we're talking about the Millennium Falcon, let's talk about the Millennium Falcon for a second. Like, I love the Millennium Falcon, Ben. Don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan. It's a great thing. Uh, that was... It's an iconic. We, we, we both we both have Lego Millennium Falcons in our house. Yes, exactly. It was an iconic thing that the in the New Hope they had this moment where Luke walks into the hangar and they pan up to the Millennium Falcon for the first time and the music swells like it's this major thing and he goes to Mark Hamill and he goes, "What a piece of junk!" And it's this. <laughs> <laughs> it is this great subversion of expectations, right? It's it's setting the stage for like, yeah, this is a big monumental, momentous thing for yeah. us, but for in the universe, this is a junky freighter. Like this yeah. is this is a cargo ship. This is literally a space truck. This yeah. is not a fighter. This it doesn't is, have a lot of firepower. No, it has no firepower. It's not small enough to be nimble. It's not supposed to. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not supposed to dogfight. It's not supposed to be able to light speed skip. And for God's sake, it's not indestructible. They landed like, oh, it's on fire. The the whole thing is on fire. And I thought, oh well, the Millennium Falcon is done forever. You broke it. This iconic ship is just trashed. But no, yeah. somehow they put it back together, and it's still. The best ship in the fleet somehow, it's a space truck. Okay, that's 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 everybody. We all love the Millennium Falcon, but we need to get off of the fact that it's just a space truck. 
I think it was, I think that was um, a moment that was indicative of what happened with this film. The Star Wars universe is indestructible and it might be on fire, but we'll put <laughs> it out and it's going to keep on going. Poe, in that scene, like it's Disney, like Poe is embodying all of Disney where it's like, oh, Star Wars, Star Wars is on fire, everybody. Go, somebody take care of that. Star Wars is on fire. <laughs> Get back, J.J. Abrams. No, and then and then we see the Mandalorian and Baby Yoda in the background with a with a fire extinguisher, trying desperately to save the whole oh, franchise. It's be okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. So, what, what's your overall rating? I mean, I'll see it again. I will. I will watch this movie again, but I'm not going to like it. Like, I will always my in isolation. It's going to have to be two different scores, right? So as a movie by itself, to sit down and just watch like a, a sci-fi action flick that makes no sense, uh, I'm going to give it a six. Like visually it was stunning. A lot of things in the movie don't make any sense. But if you're just looking for something entertaining, it's fine. If you're thinking about it as the, <laughs> as the capstone, the pinnacle of the end of this massive like franchise uh, story, uh, it's an utter and complete failure. And I, I, I can't give it a worse score. I can't give it a low enough score. Like, it, I will always lament and be tragically sad about the missed opportunity that they had in this film. And it's, That's what really feels bad. It's just this, what it could have been. Yes, that, that's the worst. And honestly, it's, it could have been so much, but we got so wrapped around, like, oh, I just want to see a stormtrooper on a motorcycle. Like, do you... Or we've got to pay homage to all of the original cast. I mean, when Han came out, I, that was another time I just uh, checked out. Oh, like, so, do, really? Do we need another Harrison Ford cameo? Uh, do we? Do, was he a Force ghost? Like, I'm assuming he was like a no, Force ghost. I, no, I think they explained it at one point where it, they did that thing for, like from um, Ratatouille where he's like, I'm a figment of your imagination. You know, like it was just Kylo Ren talking to himself. Ugh. Uh, uh. Yeah, that just feels bad. Like it, now, that said, like yeah, we don't need Harrison Ford back in this movie. But I, I, I they should have that whole thing should have been framed as a flashback with Harrison Ford, frankly, and Kylo yeah. as a kid. But they, well, they, they wanted to redo the uh, I, I what, what was the dialogue he said when they were standing on the walkway on Star Killer Base? Uh, I I know what I need to do, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. Yeah, which is. Uh, if if we can say all right, I, let's end on a positive note because we trash Star Wars constantly in this podcast. Okay. Uh, I will say that the, if we if we forget about the second movie for a minute and just think about the J.J. Abrams films, The Force Awakens and The Rise of Skywalker, I think that they did a really decent job with the redemption story of somebody that when they were first introduced to them was beyond redemption. Like this is just hands down, flat out evil. And, like, I think they did a legitimate, believable job of bringing him back around to being a real person and somebody that you cared about in the movie. Yeah, and, and I got to give a lot of that credit to Adam Driver. Yeah, I think I sent you a meme where yep. uh, it was I'll some... It. Oh, did you? <laughs> All right, so it'll be no, in the... No, sh- I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. Got it. It'll be in the show notes. This great meme, Adam Driver. It's a picture of him and, like, uh, like, a news headline on it. Breaking news, Adam Driver has back problems from carrying the entire Star Wars trilogy. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Uh, well, Star Wars. We beat that horse to death. No, no. Listen, we will be beating that horse's skeleton long after its bones have been picked clean by the vultures that are other podcasts. Yeah. Well, but you know what? It didn't do for me. It didn't kill me on Star Wars. I'm still looking forward to the next season of Mandalorian. I'm looking forward to any you know other films it may come up with and try to do before, middle, or after of what we've already seen. Uh, just today, like no kidding, like an hour ago, um, my son, we were talking about Star Wars and I told him the best lightsaber fights that I'd ever seen were in some of the cinematics that they made for the Star Wars, the old Republic, uh, online game. Like they made cinematic trailers for this video game that had hands down what are the best lightsaber fights in the Star Wars universe. Like if you haven't seen any, I'll, I'll send you links to a couple and they are just hands down the best lightsaber fights. Yeah. Still love right. Star Wars. Um, so last time I'd asked you to talk about uh, your time at the Air Force Academy. I still want to hear about that, so we'll save that for next time. And I think that brings us to the end. Uh, spoilers for my time at the Air Force Academy. Um, it is now over. 
and that is the best that can be said about it.